Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Ask a Doctor um, live series today. Um, we are going to be answering a few COVID myths and hesitancies amongst our peers and our, and our friends. Um, we gathered a few questions from Instagram as well as other youth board members um, around the community. And we just wanted to give a shout out and a thank you to everyone who participated in um, any of our polls, any of our questions on Instagram. Um, because of you, we now had a list, a growing list of questions um, that those have. And so today we are going to be um, here with Dr. Balbuena, who will be answering some of these questions. Um, I'm also um, here with Alondra, Daniela, Naija, and Jocelyn, who will introduce themselves and um, be co-host and answering and asking some questions to Dr. Barbuena. So um, my name is Annalisa Alvarez and I work as the youth outreach worker for the La Vida Partnership here at Chas Center. And um, my favorite summer activity is going camping. So I can pass it over now to Alondra who will introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Alondra Alvarez. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'm a student at Michigan State University, but been involved with La Viva since like 2013 or 2014, um, and it's 2021 now, so it's been a while. Um, and my favorite summer activity is uh, honestly anything with water. I soy bien calorosa, so being in water just makes me like feel refreshed. <laughs> Hi, my name is Daniela. Um, I'm 18 years old. I've been um, a member of the youth board at Chess Center for about almost a year now. Um, and I really wanted to do this because I wanna encourage all my loved ones to get vaccinated and hopefully this will answer all their questions. My name is Jocelyn Arroyo and I'm a rising senior at Tufts University, but I'm, um, interning at CHAS through the University of Michigan Summer Enrichment Program. Um, my favorite summer activity is like anything with ice cream, love it. And um, <laughs> and the reason why I want to do this is very similar to Daniela in that I want to help people to ask questions that they want to ask about the COVID vaccine. I know it's a very scary time. So Naisha, if you just want to introduce yourself um, and your role in the. Yeah, uh, my name is Naisha. Um, I'm born and raised Southwest Detroit. I work with the Equitable Internet Initiative and in Inside Southwest Detroit. And so uh, I think it is favorite summer activity. Um, favorite summer activity is sitting outside between like seven and nine o'clock and just being able to like cool down outside um sorry and um why am i doing this i think that there's a lot of misconceptions of what's going on with the vaccine and so um even within like my family and things like that people are asking a lot of questions and so i think i think it'll be good to be able to ask a doctor and 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 have um some clear answers for people Excellent. Thank you, everyone. My name is Felix Balbuena. I'm a family physician by training. Um, I've been affiliated with the CHAS Center for 40, no, 32 years now. And um, I'm very excited about this opportunity to be able to answer questions that you may have um, to try and continue to get uh, as many members of our community uh, vaccinated as we can. Um, there's been a lot of challenges um, over this past year, year and a half now. And um, I am um, glad that I can be here to um, uh, answer um, questions, dispel myths, and really um, get everybody motivated and excited about um, being able to get the vaccine, um, not only to protect yourself, but to protect uh, your, your community members, your family, your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues. And um, my uh, favorite summer activity is uh, traveling and uh, ideally to the beach to get some sun. 
Cool. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. Um, we are going to start with our program, but I did want to mention that we do have a set of questions that each co-host will be facilitating to Dr. Valbuena. But if you did not have the opportunity to ask us a question through polls or send us any question, please feel free to write it in the chat. Um, Danila Valdovinos will be monitoring the chat and any of the questions throughout um, the program that you have please just put them in the chat and we will answer them um, as we get them. So I will now pass it over to Alondra who will um, ask the first set of questions to Dr. Valbuena. Thank you, Ana. So before we start off with like the more serious questions, Dr. Valbuena, I have like a little fun icebreaker question for you. Um, since we're talking about summer, like what's your favorite summer snack? My favorite summer snack? Um, hmm. Well, um, I'm supposed to have healthy snacks, um, or I'm supposed to be modeling healthy snacks. I, I, I love tropical fruits. I'm, I'm of uh, Colombian origin. And um, in Latin America, we have a, a vast uh, number of uh, fruits that you don't necessarily see here. So that's that uh, on the healthy side, any, any tropical fruit, and there's hundreds of them. Um, on the not so healthy side, my favorite snacks are uh, Snickers bars and Twizzlers. Not necessarily specific to summer, but um, those are my uh, my not so healthy snacks that I don't uh, I don't uh, promote very much. It's okay, Dr. Valbuena. It's all about having balance. <laughs> um, but we can move on to the first question I have for you, okay. which is: um, Many people are fearful of getting vaccinated because they believe the vaccine is very new. Um, how long was the vaccine research prior to administrating it to the public? So that's kind of a long answer, but to, to kind of summarize it, this technology um, that's being used for the COVID vaccine has been around for decades, actually. It's been used in, uh, in cancer treatments. My father actually received uh, a cancer treatment some years back using this technology. It's new in the vaccine space, but the, the technology um, fit easily with um, the goal that we were trying to accomplish, which was to get a vaccine created and created quickly. And the coronavirus is, is one, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 is the official uh, name for it, is a coronavirus. And we've been studying coronaviruses for a while now. So it was easy to, to, to very quickly um, identify what we call the gene sequence. So the, the sequence that makes up the virus to be able to pick out the specific piece um, of um, the protein that sits on the virus that, that uh, um, this virus carries to be able to train our bodies to defend ourselves against it without having to inject any piece of the actual virus. But it's just a, 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 a gene sequence, that a messenger RNA that helps us create a protein that just happens to be a protein that sits on the surface of this virus so that our, our defenses learn how to protect ourselves without having to get exposed to the virus. Thank you so much, Dr. Valbuena, for answering my first question. Uh, my second question is, many youth are hesitant to get the vaccine because it's not FDA approved. Is the COVID-19 vaccine safe? So the COVID vaccines, the three that we're using in the United States, uh, are approved under emergency use authorization. And the only difference between emergency use authorization and the full um, approval is the length of time that it's been out in the market so that we can actually see what the side effects um, of the vaccine could be. So the, the, the testing, the, the process for, for researching it and testing it on individuals um, happen very quickly because those different steps, instead of having them um, done one after the other after the other, they were all done at the same time. Even to the point that these vaccines, even as they were being tested, they were already being mass produced and stored in the event that it would get approved, they'd already have many of the vaccines made. So the fact that there was a lot of uh, money that was not just government money, but, but uh, private money that was available to, to help develop the vaccines quickly. And instead of doing things in line, we did them all at the same time to be able to test it. Uh, we were able to get enough answers in the process to have 
the FDA give us that emergency use authorization. And soon, I don't have the exact uh, uh, timeline, but soon meaning within the last, within the next um, six to eight months, we should be able to get the official final uh, approval of uh, the vaccines that we're currently using um, in the United States. So that it's not just emergency use authorization, but the full um, authorization. And the vaccines are extremely, extremely safe. Um, this is something that I, I try and, and um, share as often as I can, is that people are worried. You see, this was a negative side effect that someone had. See, this, these vaccines aren't good. Or look what happened to, to, to this person after they got the vaccine. Everything that we do in medicine, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's a pill, whether it's a procedure, whether it's a test, has benefits and has risks to it. And we always want the benefits to be much, much, much greater than the risks of whatever that process or procedure or test or vaccine or pill may be. But there's always going to be a side effect. If you look at, uh, you ever get a prescription or even, even uh, yeah, that when you get a prescription, there'll be an insert that says all the possible side effects. And when these things are being tested, all it takes is one person in the testing group to have nausea. You have to put nausea as a possible uh, side effect, even though only one person had it. So the, the, the overall safety of the vaccines is extremely, extremely high. Um, you just have to keep in mind that everything that we do in medicine is always going to have some type of side effect. We just want to make sure that those side effects are minimal um, compared with the great benefits that we get from actually, in this case, using the vaccine. Thank you so much for answering that question. My last and final question is, some young adults are hesitant to get the vaccine because they are fearful of long-term consequences. When will it be safe to see if the vaccine had any negative consequences? So we're seeing, you know, we, the, I'll give you the example of the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So there was actually a pause because there were six women um, younger than 50 who received the vaccine who had significant serious clots. Those were six women out of almost 7 million doses of that, that vaccine that were given. So we're constantly accumulating data on the millions of people that now, you know, because they did the, the thousands, hundreds of thousands in the testing phase, but now everybody's getting the vaccine. We're collecting all that data of any, any reactions and we're reporting that. So when, when, uh, when we're administering the doses, for example, at CHAS, if there's any um, serious reactions, which there, there haven't been, knock on wood, um, we're, there's a process for us to report that so that the evidence continues to, to be documented so that we can see if there's going to be other negative consequences uh, further along the line. But with the millions and millions of doses that we've given already, we've seen that, that these vaccines are extremely safe and effective compared to even other vaccines that we have, like the ones that we get that we're mandated to get when we're when we're uh, little kids. Thank you so much. Um, I will pass it over to Annalisa now. Thank you, Alondra and Dr. Albuena. Um, next, I have Daniela, who will also be facilitating questions to Dr. Albuena. So you can go ahead, Daniela. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Valbuena. Hi, Daniela. So my first question slash icebreaker is, what was the hardest part about working virtually and maybe the easiest part of it? I would say the hardest part about working virtually um, was that we didn't get to interact uh, in the way that we normally would with, with our patients. And I, I'm uh, speaking more specifically about our, our culture, our Latino culture, we're very um, um, touchy feely, and we're we're very um, uh, about you know being in the moment and and sharing, and it, it's been very difficult to do that um, in on a on a screen or or through a screen, which is significantly better than if this was happening when um, I was your age, because at that point we didn't have this this technology to to be able to see somebody. We you know, we'd, we'd be able to hear them, but we wouldn't be able to see them. So I think that um, the hardest part uh, about working virtually has been that, that inability to, to be able to, to be close and actually um, do some of the things that we obviously can't do virtually. Listen to, you know, put a stethoscope, listen to somebody's heart, listen to, listen to their lungs. 
uh, look in their ears, you know, look in their throat. I, we could see a little bit, but look in their ears or, or look in the nose if we need to look in the nose. And those kinds of things has been um, um, extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah. And maybe what was the easiest part of it? The easiest part was that all of that travel time, all of the traffic, it takes me um, on an average day about 30 minutes to get to work and, and 30 minutes to get home. That's an hour of time that, um, you know, when we were working virtually, um, I had to prepare to, to do other things um, besides sitting in traffic or, you know, having to, 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 to drive in. So I think the, the, um, the virtual part, plus my family um, ended up uh, studying and working virtually. So that actually gave us more, more bonding time. And then our pet, we have a miniature schnauzer, was also very happy because during the day, um, she's, she's usually home uh, alone while we're, while we're at work or school. And so uh, it brought the family um, closer together during that time that we were all working virtually. Yeah. Okay, so my first question will be, what does it mean to be fully vaccinated and should we continue using face masks? Okay, so fully vaccinated means that you've received the recommended doses. So for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, are the two doses, because those are two doses. Pfizer is one dose, and then three weeks later, the second dose. Moderna is the one dose, and then four weeks later, the second dose. Or for the Johnson & Johnson, it's one dose, and then two weeks have to go by. So 14 days after you received either the second dose of the, those first two or the single dose of the Johnson & Johnson. That is the official definition of being fully vaccinated. Until those two weeks have gone by, you're not considered to be fully vaccinated. So that's the definition of that. And then should we continue to use face masks? So at this point, different states are doing different things. And I know that uh, in Michigan for outdoors, they're saying that uh, um, you, know, you really don't need uh, a mask unless you're in a, uh, a sporting event or a concert or those kinds of things. But at this point today, um, June 28th, uh, 2021, I would still say that we should be using uh, face masks. In healthcare, we're still required to use. So at CHAS, for example, all employees, all patients, anybody that comes into the center should be wearing a mask um, at all times. And the reason for that is there's still a number of individuals that aren't vaccinated and they're at risk. And we don't necessarily know who those individuals are. They're at risk of catching the virus and having bad outcomes of actually getting infected and uh, having symptoms um, of, of the COVID-19. And on top of that, um, you've probably heard of um, different variants of the virus that, that have come up. Um, those variants are created in the process of the virus going from one human to the next human. So the less chance we give the virus to go from one person to another person, the less chances of getting those, those little changes to get the, the variants, that at some point, currently it's not an issue, but that at some point uh, the vaccines may not be able to protect against, which would then put us back at square one um, for, for the vaccination campaign. So, so we talked about the fully, what fully vaccinated means. And my recommendation is that even though we're all very, very, very tired um, of wearing the face mask, that um, if we're going to be out um, and, you know, it's not at home where you know that if everybody's been vaccinated at home, um, you should still continue to wear your face masks, masks when you're out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the second question is, what should an adolescent or younger person do mm -hmm. if their parents do not want them to get vaccinated? And what are some tools or resources we provide to the parents to be better informed about the COVID-19 vaccine? That's a significant challenge because for, for minors, um, so anybody under, under 18 um, in the medical profession, we're supposed to have permission from their parent or guardian to be able to give them their vaccinations, including the ones for, for the mandated ones for school um, and to do basically any process or procedure. I think the only, um, the only exception to that would be for, for family planning uh, purposes uh, from 12 years and up um, would not need 
uh, parental consent, but we're talking about the COVID vaccine. And so to be able to get the vaccine, because uh, we want uh, mom and dad's or, or guardian's um, permission, it becomes a little bit a little bit challenging. And um, I have a, a few examples from um, two Saturdays ago when we had a vaccine campaign at uh, Cesar Chavez Academy High School, and it was the Pfizer vaccine, and it was primarily for adolescents. So they were coming with mom, dad, or, or, or guardian. And I had the, the situation where uh, both uh, mom wanted the, the three uh, uh, children to get vaccinated. The children weren't very um, sure about it. And then we had the opposite, um, where um, uh, the, the student was ready to go. And dad said, I, I have some questions before, um, you know, I let you uh, vaccinate um, my daughter. And, and in, in both of those situations, it worked out. It, it's, I think the biggest um, challenge is social media is transmitting information that may not be entirely accurate constantly. It, you're constantly bombarded with these things. And the, the opportunity to speak with somebody who is in the medical profession or, or somebody who's a, a trusted member of the community, a pastor at the church, the principal of your high school, who may not be in the medical profession, but, but is able to access the information to answer the questions that you need answered um, is, is, is challenging. It's not always easy to do. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing today is to be able to um, share information and resources. So the, the main resource that I, I always recommend is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control has uh, many different languages that the information is in um, and, and fairly uh, easy to understand. Um, um, it's not all medical um, jargon or medical terminology that, that that's being used there. So that's a way for you to, you know, uh, an adolescent that, uh, that can get to the website, pull it up, put it into Spanish or, or the language that, that, uh, that parents uh, see to, to say, this is a trusted resource to get answers to the questions that you have about the vaccine. And then the medical providers in the community like CHAS, all of our providers, the nurses, our medical assistants, um, we, we spend a lot of time going over a lot of these same questions because they had those questions for us when we were trying to get employees vaccinated. We actually have um, a little under 90% of our 141 employees at CHAS have been vaccinated. And a lot of that was due, uh, though the vast majority were individuals that really wanted it. But um, there's been a number of people who have seen the reactions um, uh, that other employees have had and have been able to ask the questions and really get the answers to what is keeping them from saying, I'm ready to, to take the vaccine. And, and now having it on demand, which we're going to talk a little bit uh, later about, is, is, um, is I think the most important uh, piece is being able to, to share uh, accurate uh, information in a, in a way that can be understood. Um, and then if the decision is a yes, because we can't force anybody to do it, if the decision is a yes, have the vaccine loaded and ready to go um, sh shortly after and not have to call and make an appointment or go online and, you know, pick a spot on a website. And um, um, those, those, those resources are, um, are readily available uh, through CHAS. And uh, um, you see on our, on our social media uh, links and QR codes that, that'll get you where you need to go to uh, get your questions answered and to get the vaccine. Thank you, doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question would be, will we need a booster shot? So the uh, evidence is leaning towards yes. Um, so it'd be similar to the flu vaccination that we get every, that we're recommended to have every year. Um, but we're, we, we don't have the time frame answered just as of yet. I believe the latest we have is we know that the vaccine is good for seven months. Uh, but that data is coming in as we vaccinate more and more people and more and more time goes by. Uh, but it's looking like uh, it's going to require a booster um, uh, every season, similar to the way that the uh, influenza vaccine um, is being done where we have the four, used to be three, now it's the four most common variants 
of influenza for that season get loaded into those vaccines. And then that's what we, that's what we get uh, in the fall. And so it's looking like it's gonna be a booster um, dose uh, once a year, but uh, that is not official yet as we continue to collect data to see if we may be able to get an added uh, level of, of protection, maybe for a two year period of span, as opposed to having to do it every year. But the, the short answer is booster more than likely, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Rabwana. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'll pass it back to Anna. Thank you so much, Daniela and Dr. Barbuena. Um, we still encourage everybody, if you continue to have questions throughout our conversations with Dr. Barbuena, to continue putting them in the chat and we will answer those questions as they come. Um, but next, I will have Naeja, um, who will facilitate questions to Dr. Barbuena. So I have a, a life altering question right now to ask you. Okay, thanks. Um, what's your favorite taco truck in Southwest? Oh, that's easy. Pete's down and out. Oh, snap. <laughs> Shout out to Pete's. Pete's um, down and out. Yep. So I have a couple questions for you. Um, so some young adults are worried about the vaccine causing fertility issues. And so um, people who might be kind of still thinking about having kids in the future um, or people that are young adults right now. Um, so can, can the vaccine lead to fertility infertility? So the short answer is the vaccines will not affect fertility in any way, shape or form. The reason why this came up and I, not to be too long winded, but the reason why this came up is a, a, a researcher in Germany saw that the protein that we're teaching our bodies to make to protect us from the coronavirus has very minimal similarities to a protein that are that woman's placenta will have. That's that's um, where the umbilical cord that that's stuck to the mom's uterus when she's pregnant, and that's where the umbilical cord comes out and goes to baby. That placenta has a protein that helps it stick to the uterus, that is very very minimally similar to the protein that we're teaching our bodies to defend ourselves uh, from the coronavirus. And so that researcher said because there's a similarity, there may be a possibility that when we get the COVID vaccine, we're actually teaching our bodies how to fight against the placenta. So then the placenta won't stick. And so then there's the fertility problem. The similarities, if you, I'm, I'm trying to make it um, really simple. Um, the similarity would be like comparing an elephant and a mouse. And the similarity is that they're both gray. So that's how big of a difference is. And the risk, there is no risk because they're, they're, the, the differences in the protein, our immune systems are so intelligent that uh, the, the defenses that our bodies are creating will never affect that protein on the placenta. So that's where that myth uh, came up from. And the answer is that the COVID vaccines will not affect fertility and the possibility of becoming parents in the future. Thank you. Um, and so keeping on the, the, the thread of uh, women's health, mm -hmm. um, there's a question about can the vaccine affect a woman's uh, menstrual cycle? Um, what okay. or something? Yep. So um, there have been there have been some some cases where after receiving the, the vaccine, women have reported that their their cycle became a little longer. Uh, maybe a little heavier or shorter, that it, that it changed. Um, and that more than likely, it's not confirmed yet because there hasn't been enough cases um, for the medical professionals to make a, a, a determination one way or another. But I can tell you that um, uh, an emotional uh, state or another uh, illness, you have a, a pneumonia or you have a bladder infection or, or something that will also affect a woman's menstrual cycle. It's short-lived. It's not a, it's not a, a permanent uh, thing, but, but the, in any given month, your, your, your uh, emotional state or maybe another, another uh, um, uh, uh, medical condition can affect um, the hormones and the way that they work and make the um, menstrual cycle, the actual period heavier 
or lighter or last a little longer, um, but not in any um, longstanding or permanent uh, way. And that is something that we're still accumulating data on. And uh, um, so the short answer is it looks like maybe in some cases in the short term, it can affect a little bit, but it's not something that's going to be uh, longstanding and is similar to some of the other events and other, other situations in women's lives that can, you know, um, make them skip a month or, or, uh, or have a little bit different uh, cycle in a given month. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I had just have one last question. And so um, does the COVID vaccine cause a change in breast size for women, making them larger, anything like that? Okay, so this is something that we have seen um, and actually has been documented is women who are getting the COVID vaccine um, on the side of the body that they get the vaccine in, the lymph nodes, so that's where um, our body's immune system works to um, fight an infection, um, a, a bacteria or a virus, and is the part of the body where the vaccine is triggering that response, that immune or defense response, they get a little bit larger. And there are some in your, in your armpit, in your, we call it the axilla next to the breast. And so we have had early on, there were women that were in the age where they would get a mammogram um, uh, and they would go get their mammogram and then they would get referred because they found a spot that needs to be looked at, maybe biopsied or needs more testing. And it turns out that they had just received the COVID vaccine and it was in that arm. And after they looked at it a little bit deeper, it was actually not breast tissue, but it was actually that lymph node. There's a number of lymph nodes that sit there in, the, in, in your armpit that had gotten a little bit larger because of the fact that that woman's immune system was creating the defenses against um, uh, the virus. And so that is a common question now for women that get scheduled or are going to be scheduled for a mammogram. Have you had the COVID vaccine recently? So that when the radiologist, those are the doctors that read those images will know, oh, she just had her COVID vaccine. So if you see a lymph node, that's not necessarily the, her body fighting against cancer, but that is because that was the arm that she received the COVID vaccine on. And it's a very short period of time. It's, it's maybe a week or two where, where that, uh, that lymph node, will, you'll, you'll feel it. Um, it can get pretty hard and it can be tender when you touch it, uh, would get a little bit larger, but that is a normal response of the immune system uh, creating the defenses against that protein that we're teaching it to do. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will pass back to Annalisa. Thank you, Dr. Valbuena and Aisha, um, for touching on these myths that are very present in around our community and as well as our age group. Um, we did receive a lot of these questions and a lot of these um, myths through our Instagram polls. So thank you so much for touching on this. Once again, if you continue to have questions, please put them in the chat. We are open to answering any and all questions. Um, next, I will pass it over to Jocelyn who will facilitate our next set of questions. Dr. Valbuena. Hi, Jocelyn. Um, so my, hi. So my icebreaker question is, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? If I could have any superpower, what could it be? I wish I could fly. I, I, I always, um, and they're not related, but um, as I was thinking when I was younger about becoming a physician, I also thought about maybe becoming a pilot. Uh, so being able to fly, I just, I just um, enjoy um, being up in the air. <laughs> and you save a lot on airline tickets too. So yes, I would, you know, <laughs> yes. Um, so is it true that through the vaccine, the government is, um, inserting a chip to track us? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult, I mean, it's a difficult myth to, to counteract because all we can say is no, there's nothing, you know, the, the vaccine, um, is made up of, you know, some fairly common things, including a little bit of, of uh, fatty substance, a little bit of sugar, and that, you know, all helps the vaccine get to where it needs to go to do what it needs to do. Um, but there is no, um, and that I'm not sure where that came up from, but there is no uh, chip that is being uh, inserted uh, to track us. They don't make them, they don't make them that tiny yet uh, um, to be able to get them in that very small quantity of a vaccine that's uh, that's being injected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
So in the media, we talked a lot about like how the vaccine causes a DNA mutation. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that that mutation can lead to us becoming zombie-like? Or can you also explain like how that process works a little bit more? Yes. So the vaccine never, ever, ever, ever interacts with our DNA. So the vaccine gets into our cell and an area called the cytoplasm, but not into the let's say the nerve center of the cell, which is called the nucleus. The nucleus is what holds the DNA. And the vaccine, the mRNA, the messenger RNA never gets into our DNA. So it's not, it's not interacting with our DNA. What it's doing is in the cytoplasm, which is the fluid in the cell, um, not in the, in the nucleus and not in the, the, the brain, let's say, of the cell where the DNA is, is there for a short period of time, teaching that cell how to make this protein that we, that we want it to, to make, and then it, it dissolves. That, that messenger RNA that's getting injected is only, it's very short-lived, it's in there for a short period of time to show that cell how to make a little bit of that protein that then our defense system is gonna learn how to protect itself against. So when the virus gets in, with that protein on it, um, we can we can protect ourselves, but it never gets into the nucleus, so it never interacts with our DNA, so it's not going to turn us into something different like a zombie. Thank you. And then on that same token, um, can vaccines make our bodies magnetic? I know there's been a lot of that on like TikTok and like, you know, people yeah, I, I, I'm I'm. Um, I've seen some of those those videos, and all I, the only way that I can explain that is that some of us are a little bit stickier uh, than others, because again, there's no medical, there's no medical, there's no metal particles uh, inside. There's there's metal in the needle that's putting it inside of us, but that doesn't stay inside um, when we, you know, once it's injected. And the actual solution, the liquid that's going in, has no uh, metal particles uh, in it. So, um, you know, I, I've seen the videos and I'm not exactly sure how they're, they're doing that, but, but we're, not, um, we're not becoming magnetic. We're not, we're not magnetic because of the vaccine. Thank you. And my final question, which is on a more serious note, um, is can the COVID vaccine cause kidney failure? COVID-19 can cause kidney failure, but the vaccine um, doesn't cause uh, kidney failure. We're actually using the vaccine. There's very few instances where somebody that comes in and says, I want the vaccine. We have to tell them, sorry, we can't give you the, the vaccine. And, and the, the, the short answer to that are uh, those that can't are the ones that have had a, we call it an anaphylactic reaction. And that is a reaction um, from an injectable. It doesn't have to be a vaccine. Could be, uh, there's a few um, uh, birth control methods that are injected, um, or there are some actual antibiotics that get injected that will cause this anaphylactic reaction, which is a severe uh, uh, reaction in your body that closes your airway and you actually have to go into the hospital and get a tube, uh, um, get intubated, a tube down your throat to help you breathe. Those are the individuals that we are um, saying that you know it, it's 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 a tough call for them to get the vaccine because we don't want them to uh, have that type of a, a reaction and if if they still want we want that to occur in the hospital so that we're prepared because th those can be counteracted but they can't necessarily be counteracted if you're not ready for it but people who have diabetes people who have high blood pressure people who have high cholesterol people who have cancer people who have kidney failure liver failure uh uh, transplants, um, all of those individuals, all of those individuals were, were recommending that they get uh, the vaccine because the benefits of having the vaccine by far outweigh um, the, the risks of, of getting um, vaccinated. And so the vac COVID-19 vaccine will not cause kidney failure, but COVID-19 can cause kidney failure. We've seen that in some cases. Thank you so much. And then I'll pass it back over to Anavisa. 
Alrighty, um, thank you all for facilitating and Dr. Luna for answering those questions. Um, we do want to touch base a little bit about how you can um, get vaccinated at Chess Center um, and a little bit of how that process looks like for um, anyone who is 12 years or older versus 18 years and older, because I know there is a little bit of a difference. So Dr. Baduena, if you kind of want to touch base on that, um, sure. I'll leave it open for that. Excellent. So um, currently we're using two vaccines at CHAS. We're using the Pfizer vaccine, which we just recently on uh, the last few weeks started. Um, and we've been primarily using the Moderna vaccine. The Moderna vaccine has been approved under emergency use authorization for individuals 18 years of age and older. And initially that's what we were using for our employees, for the, you know, as they were asking us to vaccinate those that were 65 and older first, um, for all those individuals. Now that we've gotten 70% um, of individuals 30 years of age and older, and we're really focusing on the young adults, like those that are hopefully listening to us tonight um, and watching us tonight, that um, we want to get to that same percentage or higher. Uh, we're using the Pfizer vaccine because the Pfizer vaccine is approved from 12 years of age and up. Um, so that covers the 12 through 17 that the Moderna doesn't. Um, and so the um, vaccines are both available uh, on a walk-in basis. So, you know, ideally from a, from a, we call it a workflow perspective. So an, an efficiency to being able to get you in and out quicker. We ideally want someone to call, make an appointment. We have vaccine available every day of the week, except for Sunday. Um, but if you don't call and you just walk in, we can do that also. We want um, individuals that are younger than 18 to have a parent or a guardian uh, because you know we don't wanna be in a situation where a 12 to 17 comes in, wants the vaccine, we give them the vaccine and then their uh, parent or guardian finds out and then comes in and, and it could be a legal uh, issue for the center um, because of the way that the laws are. Uh, for minors to get treated uh, medically. For 12 to 17 year olds that are already established patients at CHAS, part of what the parents uh, or guardians sign when you become a patient is that uh, they're consenting to medical treatment, including medications and vaccines for the individuals that they're, you know, that we're documenting that for and they're signing. So if this is an, a, a CHAS established patient, um, you know, ideally, um, unless they're riding their bike, um, you know, they, they don't have their driver's license yet that someone would come with them, but ideally we already have the consent, um, because the parent is actually signing off on that, uh, when they become a CHAS patient, but because we're accepting anybody that wants a vaccine, uh, doesn't have to be a CHAS established patient. Doesn't have to be a Henry Ford established patient. Doesn't even have to live in Southwest Detroit. I'll give you an example. Um, last week we gave the second dose of a Pfizer vaccine to a lady that had received her first dose of the Pfizer vaccine three weeks prior in Barranquilla, Colombia. So you do not have to be, um, you know, there's no charge. So there's no anything related to COVID, whether it's the COVID test, the COVID vaccine, or up until shortly um, recently, we were doing the monoclonal antibody infusion. So that's another uh, method of helping to to build uh, defenses against the, the coronavirus. Nothing related to the coronavirus from a medical perspective is being charged um, to the individual. So there's no, there's no cost um, to that. Um, we're actually providing transportation for those that live uh, in, our, in our catchment area. And I know that Uber and I believe Lyft is also, I know Uber for sure, but I think Lyft also will provide free rides for those that can document that they're going in to get um, a vaccine. Um, so that that is, um, you know, we're really working hard to help um, decrease all of the possible barriers. You know, language. Chas has never had an issue with that uh, for for our the, the majority of our community, um, English and Spanish, and the culture, and the transportation, um, the cost. There is no cost to this. And then, you know, it doesn't require calling and, and necessarily waiting on the phone uh, as 
can happen for other things um, at the center. You can walk in as long as it's during our business hours and you'll get your, your vaccine. Um, we're, we're as, as medical providers, we're asking, that's one of the things we're asking everybody as they come in, including pregnant women. That wasn't a question that, that uh, was asked to me, but um, uh, is one that we get frequently. Can pregnant women get the vaccine? Pregnant women can get the vaccine. And so we're, we're asking everybody that comes into the center um, during their stay, during their visit, um, have you been vaccinated? If the answer is no, our, our goal is to answer all the questions and get them ready. And when they say yes, send them upstairs to get, uh, get their vaccine. So a little bit of difference between the, 20, the 12 to 17 and the 18 and older, just because of the legal uh, ramifications of, of, uh, of administering the vaccine and the, and the consent that we need for that. But the, uh, all the other things that we're doing to decrease barriers are the same uh, for everybody. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I just have an additional question. Um, what do you need to bring to the vaccine um, appointment? Is there any information that the government will receive? Um, just any barrier within that? And also, if you're ready to get your vaccine, what would you need to bring to that appointment or to that walk-in? <laughs> yeah, so we're trying to um, gather information that helps us show that we're vaccinating the individuals um, in our community. And so uh, we have in Michigan, we have something called the Michigan Care Improvement Registry. It is a registry managed in Lansing, uh, the capital of Michigan, that um, anybody that administers a vaccine, whether it's a, a baby getting um, a vaccine, whether it's an adult um, getting a pneumonia vaccine or getting the COVID vaccine, any vaccine that's given by any provider in the state, we're supposed to report that um, to that registry so they can keep track of, you know, are we, are we protecting Michiganders or individuals in the state of Michigan against all of these different um, infections that um, along the way have been mandated for kids or not mandated, but available to help prevent um, individuals from getting sick. And they collect demographics. Um, and, and, and the reason we collect demographics too, the reason why we do that is to be able to make sure that that vaccination record is accurate and has that, that we've identified that person um, that has gotten. So that way we know um, if you lose your vaccine card um, or mom loses the baby's vaccine card, we know what vaccines have been given, when they were given, so that we're doing it in the way that we know is gonna protect um, that individual from that disease. Uh, that information um, is, is healthcare information. And so that's not shared. Um, you know, I, I know that there's issues of uh, uh, migration status and um, none of that goes because it's medical. None of that goes to um, uh, Department of Homeland Security and, and all of the entities that might be involved um, with uh, migration uh, status for an individual. Um, we do um, want to ideally identify that the person that's on this list that's getting the vaccine is actually the person in front of me. And so if there is a picture ID, it could be a school ID, something that has the name and a face so that we can see that we, you know, we spell the name right and, and that we're not creating a second record uh, for that individual is ideal. But if there is no, no uh, picture ID, we're still doing it. We're going to, we're, we're taking the individual's word or the parent or guardian's word for the adolescent, that this is who is getting the vaccine. I mean, the, the, the goal is to, to get everybody vaccinated and, and we want to be able to show that we are uh, here for our community and that we're getting our community vaccinated. And so there is no, there is no, um, um, you know, if there is a picture ID, great. If there isn't, not a problem. We just want to make sure we have the information right. <clears throat> so only one record is created that that the, the vaccine, whatever that vaccine may be, in this case, the COVID-19 vaccine was given accurately. Thank you so much. Um, we did have one question from our Facebook audience. Okay. Um, and that question is, what can someone do to get ready for the vaccine? Should they consume water, food? Should they take the day off? And what arm um, will they receive the vaccine on? Okay, so, um, Getting ready, there really isn't anything. You don't have to eat something special or be fasting um, to get the vaccine. Ideally, um, we want you to be as, um, to have your day be as normal as possible. 
So depending on when you're coming, we want, definitely want you to have eaten breakfast. We want you to have eaten lunch. You know, if it's, if you're coming after lunch for individuals that are diabetics, we definitely want to make sure that, you know, if you're injecting your, your insulin uh, or taking your, your diabetes medication that you're, you know, eating what you need to eat. Cause we don't want you to have an episode where your sugar drops um, while you're, you're, you're getting the vaccine. Some individuals have some anxiety. Um, you know, they have a fear of needles or they just have an anxiety as we've talked about different things related to the vaccine. And so having a support person with you to, to you know, talk you through that, our, our um, um, vaccine um, facilitators, as well as uh, the medical assistants that are actually given the vaccine, there's always a provider uh, available to come and answer questions. And, and um, you know, we have all the emergency things that we may need. If someone has a reaction, we have what's called an EpiPen that will help, um, you know, if, if someone didn't know they had an allergy that gets an allergy, we have the, you know, all the medical equipment uh, that we would need. We have oxygen, we have the blood pressure cuff and those kinds of things. So there really isn't any special preparation. Um, we do know that there is, there is some uh, anxiety just to the fact that someone's coming to a medical facility. People sometimes get anxious just walking into the center. Um, so we, we understand that and we want to be supportive in every way, shape or form that we can. Um, but there is no um, special uh, preparation for it. And then um, um, after, for some of the, the, the symptoms that you can get, you know, uh, oh, arm wise, it's up to, it's up to uh, the individual. The, the, I forget, I think it's based on, on the medical assistant, which arm they like best based on the position that they're at. But it's not that, that it's better to get it in the right or better to get it in the left. And, and I have helped in these vaccine events to put the information into the, the computer. And that's one of the things that they have to put the document so that I put it in there that we gave it in the left arm or we gave it in the right arm, but there isn't any preference. Uh, it's all patient preference. And some patients will say, it doesn't matter whichever one you want. So the medical assistants will pick one and we document that. So as far as arm is related, um, it doesn't, doesn't matter um, which one. And then for the side effects, um, a little bit of redness, a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of muscle ache, a little bit of itching, um, whatever you would have at home to help um, take care of that. So Tylenol, um, uh, Advil or Motrin, um, Claritin or Zyrtec if it gets itchy, or just getting a, an ice pack, putting a little bit of ice in a Ziploc and putting that there. Those symptoms, uh, if they don't happen to everybody, but if they happen, uh, usually 24, 36, 48 hours maximum, and they, they go away, most people don't have to take time off of uh, work or school. But if there are uh, um, symptoms that, you know, they feel that, that it's not safe for them to go to work because of whatever symptom that is, as long as we, they reach out to us and we document that, uh, that uh, we can see that we gave them the vaccine, we can give you a day or two off, you know, medically right for a day or two off work if that's something that, uh, that's helpful um, to, to help while you get um, over those symptoms. But those, those side effects that, that individuals, not all individuals, but that some individuals get are very, very minimal compared to what could happen if you actually do get the virus and end up in the hospital. And I, I work at Henry Ford Hospital also, so I've seen um, a lot um, over these last 16 months. And, and uh, the side effects of getting the vaccine are nothing compared to actually getting uh, the virus and, and, and what can happen in that situation. Thank you so much. Um, we do have less than 10 minutes um, of our scheduled time, but we did receive a comment that I wanted to share with you, Dr. Edwina, sure. that maybe you can address. So it says, GBS and transverse mellitus are pretty life-changing side effects from vaccines that people get, including my mom, after getting shingles. Uh, could you address that um, question? Yeah, so GBS is the Guillain-Barre system. It's uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. That and the transverse mellitus, those are, those are nervous system um, basically conditions or side effects that can happen um, with vaccines and um, many different vaccines. So again, it goes back to, we don't want anybody to have any negative side effects to anything that we do in medicine. But unfortunately, everything that we do has the possibility of having a side effect. So in this individual's uh, situation where, where her mom um, got uh, GBS and transverse myelitis after getting the shingles vaccine. We know that that can happen, but it's so rare 
that and the benefit of actually protecting yourself against the shingles is so much greater that we still recommend getting the shingles vaccine in, in, in that specific uh, in that specific situation. So it, 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 it's important for us to know those side effects um, if they've happened in the, those reactions, if they've happened uh, in the past. And um, we don't want that to happen to anybody, but we know that there are gonna be uh, some uh, side effects, uh, possible side effects to everything that we do in medicine, including uh, the shingles vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Um, we did have one more question. So okay. is there any medical condition that should be disclosed prior to getting the vaccine? Um, so we ask a few questions. There's um, um, a COVID-19 vaccine screening form that we have uh, individuals helping to answer those if they're, if they're um, um, somewhat difficult to understand. But basically, it's those individuals that have had those life altering reactions, um, and we call it the anaphylactic type reactions, um, as well as uh, we ask about individuals that are taking blood thinners, people that have had clots that are on chronic blood thinners. So they're, they're, they have a tendency to bleed and to have more difficult time stopping bleeding. Um, not because we're going to tell them don't get the vaccine, but we want to know if we're poking somebody who's on a blood thinner, we need to make sure that we put a little added pressure on the gauze after and that we put the, 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 um, the bandaid over it a little bit, uh, a little bit tighter and, and that we keep an eye on that. So there's, there's some questions that we ask about um, medical conditions, uh, the, I know the blood thinner, the, those reactions, uh, individuals that have received that monoclonal antibody infusion. So just really briefly, th that's an infusion of the actual defenses that your body's going to make, but we inject them in you um, if you're at a high risk of having a bad outcome after having a COVID positive test. And so those individuals were saying that they should wait up to 90 days before they actually get the COVID vaccine. So that's one of the questions that we ask. It's about eight or nine questions. And they've changed a little bit based on the information that we learn as we spend more time and given more doses of vaccine. And we learn because that's, that's, that's the goal is as we learn about things, we want to make sure that we're adjusting and tweaking uh, to make sure that we're, we're being as safe as we can. And but at the same time that we're vaccinating uh, as many individuals as we can. Okay, and just one more additional comment that was made. Um, so this person said on Facebook, uh, not sure if I missed this information, are we going to have to get a third shot for those fully vaccinated with Pfizer or Moderna shots? Yeah, so it wouldn't necessarily be a third shot, it would be the booster shot. Um, um, we, we, we count initially, we get two of the Pfizer and Moderna. The boosters would just be one, uh, looks like it would just be one dose, so you don't need to even with the influenza. So influenza is uh, approved for six months of age and older. So at six months, when you get your very first in your lifetime, you get your very first uh, as a baby uh, influenza vaccine, you actually get two of them. Uh, and then after that, you just get one. So the answer to the question is it's looking like that booster dose uh, that looks like it's going to be annual would just be a, a single dose uh, vaccine, as opposed to two like we did initially. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily count it as third. We would just count it as a booster dose because then, you know, 10 years down the line, you could be on your ninth um, and it's not really considered a ninth mm, dose. It's just counted as the booster for that calendar year that we're in or that season that we're in. Yes, thank you so much for addressing those comments and concerns in the Facebook Live. Um, Dr. Rodwena, if you want to um, touch base on the family vaccination campaign that you're yes. currently hosting, please go ahead. Yes. So um, we've been undergoing a campaign right now. Uh, it's a family vaccination campaign and it ends this Saturday. So you just have a few days left to take, be able to take advantage uh, of that campaign. But what we're doing is for families that come to get vaccinated, each individual in the family that gets a vaccine is getting a $15 gift card and um, also being um, um, entered into a raffle that's gonna happen uh, the following week uh, for some excellent uh, prizes um, to, to try and, and get individuals uh, motivated uh, to get the vaccine. So through this Saturday, including this coming Saturday um, at the CHAS Center, um, anybody that uh, comes to get vaccinated, um, gets their first dose of the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, will get a, uh, a $15 gift card and that entry into the, um, the raffle. 
for some excellent prizes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we hope that we answered your questions, your hesitancies and myths that have been around our community, around our friend groups, and just in general. Um, we are still and can answer questions. Um, please follow Chess Center on Facebook and Instagram. And you can always direct message, private message us your questions or concerns. You can also call the center at any moment um, that you have a question before getting vaccinated. We are very open and answering any questions as you noticed today. Um, and no question is silly or um, we wouldn't answer. We will find the best that we can to answer that question. Um, so just wanted to give a huge shout out, a huge thank you to Alon Andra, Daniela, Naeja, Jocelyn, and Dr. Balbuena for being on this um, live stream. We hope that you all enjoyed and that you did get some useful information from us. Um, as always, please continue um, to spread information and to really promote um, those and having your family members um, continue to being safe and to just get um, vaccinated. We are open to any questions or comments here at Chess Center. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Much. I don't know if Dr. Alwena, you have some final remarks, um, but if not, that would be the end of our life. So for those of you listening um, that haven't been vaccinated yet, uh, we look forward to seeing you at the center this week and um, I will be there. So if you want to uh, say hi or you have any questions, um, let them know um, at, the, at the vaccine station that uh, you wanted to say hi and I'd, I'd be glad to come out and, uh, and support you, say hi, answer questions that final questions that you may have as you're getting vaccinated. So if you haven't been vaccinated, we look forward to seeing you very, very soon at CHAS. And uh, remember this week we have that campaign. So you, uh, everybody in the family that gets one would walk away with a gift card. Thank you.